Feel free to take it away, Hill. <laughs> Come on. Thanks, Kurt. Okay, so welcome everyone to our panel and fishbowl discussion about the history of land grabs and how to fight back. My name is Hope. I use she, her pronouns, and I am an apprentice at the Radical Real Estate Law School. And I'm Tia. I also use she and her pronouns, and I'm one of the supervising attorneys at the Radical Real Estate Law School. Thank you all so much for joining us for our final event of Radical Real Estate Week, um, which is part of our fundraiser here at the Law Center. Please donate so that our Radical Real Estate Law School can continue to host free events like this one. Um, and if Chris or Neil can please drop a link into the chat box, that would be great. If not, I'll put it in later. So first, we need to acknowledge that the Sustainable Economies Law Center office is on the stolen occupied lands of the Ohlone and Shokinio peoples who lived on and stewarded this land for thousands of years. Next, we want to thank Elliot Hellman for being our ASL speaker today. If you... Um, need ASL interpretation, please pin Elliot Hellman's um, screen. And finally, we want to thank all of our guest speakers. There are so many and they're all amazing. They're doing great work in land and housing justice and they're going to introduce themselves in alphabetical order. Uh, don't worry, you'll, oh wait, no. Oh yeah, uh, don't worry, you'll hear more from them later. Just right now, they'll share their names, pronouns, and the organizations they are repping. Starting with Alvina. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alvina Wong. I'm with the Asian Pacific Environmental Network, also located in Stolen Ohlone land, I'm working in the Bay Area of Oakland and Richmond with uh, low-income immigrant and Asian immigrant and refugee communities around environmental justice and housing. Um, and I use she, her pronouns. Thank you. Um, Annette will not be here. Okay, Corina. Hi, my name is Karina Gould. I am the co-founder of the Segorite Land Trust and the tribal chair of the Confederated Villages of Lashon. I'm happy to be here today. And I use she, her pronouns. Thank you. Jeff. Hello, everyone. My name is Jeff Conant. I use he, him pronouns. I work with Friends of the Earth United States, um, and I'm living and working on occupied Ohlone territory. Um, I direct the International Forest Program with Friends of the Earth, and we'll be talking a little bit about international land grabbing today. Thanks. Thank you. Jesus. Saludos a, a todos y todas. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Jesus Vasquez. Um, I'm calling from uh, Boriquen, uh, Puerto Rico, in the Caribbean. I'm the general coordinator for Organización Boricua de Agricultura Ecológica, which is Organización Boricua of uh, Agroecology. And, uh, and we are also a chapter of the international peasant movement uh, called La Vía Campesina. Happy to be here. Thank you. Lydia. Hi, everyone. I'm Lydia Lowe, she, her, and I'm coming to you from the Massachusetts lands, um, all the Massachusetts and Wampanoag peoples in uh, Chinatown of Boston. Thank you. Neil? Hi, everyone. My name is Neil Hopper. Um, I use he, him pronouns. I'm based in Oakland, also occupied Ohlone territory, and I'm um, one half of the Minnow team, which I'll share more about, and um, for at least a bit longer, Food and Farm Program Director at Sustainable Economies Law Center. No need. Hi, my name is Noni Session. Um, I'm the Executive Director of the East Bay Permanent Real Estate Cooperative and a third generation West Oaklander. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit today around the ways that we're using um, community investment and collective economic action um, to reclaim space in Oakland and the Bay Area. Okay. Richard? 
So Guli Skogwek, Lotni Gulios to Nium Gets. Good day, everybody. My name is Richard Elmhill. I'm a program officer for First Nations Development Institute. Um, I come from the Oneida Nation of Wisconsin. Um, our organization um, is based in Longmont, Colorado, and we support tribal communities um, with their kind of health and economic efforts uh, through grant making uh, to support uh, tribal communities. Um, I work in the foods area, so um, lots of awesome food projects um, and connections around Indian country. Welcome. Thank you. And last but not least, Savi. If Savi is here. Okay, maybe later, but first, um, Hope and I are going to start with a super quick 15 minute um, quick history of land grabs in the United States. And then we'll open up to a panel discussion where you'll hear from all of these awesome speakers. Um, and then we'll have a fishbowl discussion, which will be participatory and all of you can attend or participate. But first we'll start with Hope and me. Is Hope on mute? I'm doing so well today. <laughs> Um, I, so as we all know, the United States was founded on the near complete genocide of indigenous people. This horrific violence continues today. And of course it includes the oppression and marginalization of BIPOC farmers and communities. And uh, one of the main tools of course that the United States has used is the land grab. And what we mean by land grabs is the taking of large parcels of land by corporations and governments. Uh, so growing up, I'm embarrassed to say, but I was taught and believed a story that went something like this. The, um, the Europeans successfully conquered the entire continent that we're on today and then carved out some spaces for Native Americans, called them reservations, and then just gave it to them, like out of the goodness of their heart. And what really happened, though, is that having failed to take over completely, European nations and their American colonies lulled Indian nations into a false sense of security by entering into treaties and forging peace agreements. And uh, when the United States became its own country, it continued this practice of negotiating with Indian nations and signing these treaties. For example, this slide has a photo of a treaty signing by William T. Sherman and the Sioux Nation at Fort Laramie, Wyoming in 1868. And in case you can't see the caption in the photo, it says that the treaty guaranteed the Lakota ownership of the Black Hills and further land and hunting rights in South Dakota, Wyoming, and Montana. In 1877, the U.S. government violated the treaty agreement and seized control of the Black Hills. The Sioux Nation sued and was award, awarded $106 million for the stolen land, but the Sioux Nation refused to take the money. Having never willingly relinquished title to the land, Mount Rushmore is on the stolen Lakota land, and we'll come back to this later. Um, and then also when I was in law school, one of the first cases we read was Johnson v. McIntosh, which was decided in 1823. In that case, the Supreme Court ruled that the United States didn't have to recognize title to lands that was granted under um, Indian tribes or nations. And the reasoning was this, and I quote, this is a direct quote, the tribes of Indians inhabiting this county were fierce savages. They said that to leave them in possession of their country was to leave the country a wilderness. And Johnson v. McIntosh is still good law today. It was never overturned. And this story that the country was wilderness before white people came is obviously a myth and it's an incredibly dangerous one. Those out of controlled wildfires a few weeks ago, that is a direct consequence of this myth. Yeah, this slide has a picture of a white geographer named John Palliser who ignorantly said that controlled burning was a disastrous habit. Um, but as we're all learning now, um, indigenous peoples have used controlled burning to protect the land for millennia. 
In fact, the Europeans were totally incapable of stewarding the land and conquering true wilderness. What the Europeans were good at was the skill of conquering other people. For example, before coming here, the Elster Scott settlers perfected the skill of scalping for bounty when the indigenous Irish were their victims. Um, to learn more about this, I recommend reading chapter three of An Indigenous People's History of the United States by Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz. So this interactive map produced by historian Claudio Sant shows a time lapse between 1776 and 1887 of how the US took more than 1.5 billion acres of land from the Native Americans. The blue signifies Indian homelands. The red signifies land on reservations. And, um, most of this land was taken by forcible removal or treaty. Some of those tre treaties guaranteed that the federal government would provide annuities and food rations. Um, and they obviously broke those treaties so much and that resulted in starvation and conditions of extreme poverty on reservations. The federal government pointed to that extreme poverty when they talked about how native lifestyles were backward and uncivilized. So they enacted the Dawes Act in 1887 to assimilate the natives and provide even more opportunity for land grabbing. Um, so the Dawes Act took land that was under communal tribal ownership and then it broke the land into parcels and uh, allotted those parcels to individual tribal members, which could eventually be sold to non-Indians. Note that by many accounts, the author of the Dawes Act, Senator Dawes, was a well-meaning legislator the idea was that if each Indian household had a plot of land that they could sell or farm on, then they'd be risen out of poverty and assimilate into American culture. But the Dawes Act, um, of course, was responsible for reducing indigenous controlled land from 138 million acres in 1887 to just 48 million acres by 1934. Excuse me. Bless you, Tia. <laughs> So we'll talk a little bit more about the hashtag land back movement later on, but let's turn to the history of how the US stole land from black folks. So after being enslaved to work on the land for um, centuries, black people were promised a mythical 40 acres and a mule. When the promise of reparations was revoked by President Andrew Jackson, two generations of freed black workers saved up money and bought every plot of land that they could. By 1920, they saved up enough to buy roughly 15 million acres of farmland. At the, at the time, there were nearly 1 million black farmers in the United States. But by 1974, there were only 45,594 black farmers and they controlled only 3.6 million acres of land. In the 2000s, the numbers dwindled even more down to 18,000 farmers. This loss of black owned farmlands since the 1950s often came through legal mechanisms, the tax sale, the partition sale, the foreclosure and eminent domain. Um, so about eminent domain, um, government agencies can use eminent domain to take privately owned land for public use. In the United States, uh, the Fifth Amendment provides that the government can only take land if they pay just compensation to the property owners. No surprise here, though, that the U.S. government would seize land from Black families without just compensation. For example, in 1942, the U.S. Navy used eminent domain to take land from the Espy family in Florida to build an airfield. The Espy's land included a 30 acre fruit grove, two houses and 40 house lots. The Navy appraised the property at $8,000 and the Espy's were like, well, that's too little. So they sued and an all white jury agreed that 8,000 was too little. And they slapped on a measly $5,000 extra on top for a total award of $13,000. 20 years later, the city of Vero Beach sold part of the Espy's land to the Los Angeles Dodgers, ignoring the Espy's uh, pleas to sell the land back to them. The Dodgers then sold the property to Indian River County for $10 million in 2001. 
Also, back when the Navy seized their land in 1942, they offered the white neighbors of the Espy family six times as much for a similar land. The Espy family had to fight for that measly $13,000. And that kind of racism was not uncommon. We saw it um, in how white tax assessors defrauded black farmers by setting tax assessments too high. This led to unaffordable tax obligations, which resulted in more land being purchased by wealthy white people. We also saw, saw this type of racism in how the USDA doled out agricultural loans. They basically threw money at white farmers and denied or delayed applications from Black and Native American farmers. This racial discrimination by the USDA uh, resulted in the largest civil rights settlement to date when Black farmers fought in the Supreme Court case Pigford v. Glickman. And for many, the settlement came too late. The racist practices already caused many Black farmers to lose their land. More overt acts of racism included lynchings, police brutality, and even murderous legislators. Eugene Hunter Hearst was a farmer, politician, and murderer in Mississippi. He killed Herbert Lee, a Black cotton farmer and voter registration organizer. And despite accounts that the attack was unprovoked, an all-white jury, again, concluded that Eugene Hunter Hearst acted in self-defense. Let's fast forward to the 2008 financial collapse and foreclosure crisis, which was the greatest loss of Black wealth in modern U.S. history. The term land grab actually achieved popularity during this time um, when large corporations began acquiring farmland and foreclosed homes as a new source of revenue. During the Great Recession, 5 million families lost their homes nationwide. Wall Street firms sensed an opportunity to make a big profit and started buying up single family homes. In California alone, Blackstone, a Wall Street firm, bought 13,000 homes. Um, and other firms like Blackstone gobbled up a bunch of homes with the help of banks that would bundle up a bunch of foreclosed properties and then sell them in so-called bundled auction sales. That's why there are so many vacant homes, creating artificial scarcities and increasing rents. Uh, previously, focused on housing tracts, apartment complexes, and shopping malls, real estate investment trusts um, are now increasingly investing money to buy large swaths of fertile farmland. And that's dangerous because real estate investment trusts, by definition, always put profit over people. Because as an investment tool, the primary goal of a real estate investment trust is to generate a profit for its investors. And this means that all other considerations, including the needs of farm workers, soil health, and watersheds are secondary to the profitability of the asset. And now we're in an ecologically rooted pandemic and a looming economic crisis. Many people have lost their jobs and are not able to make their rental and mortgage payments. So, okay, so that whole history was pretty depressing, but what can we do? Let's take back the land, ban land grabs, ban big landlords. These may sound like just slogans, but they're possible. So tonight, E.B. Preck is hosting a teach-in about squatting and adverse possession. One of our radical real estate law school apprentices, Christine, who's in the middle with her kid, is a presenter. And so check it out to learn about how squatters are occupying homes to keep their family safe. Other folks occupy monuments to take land back symbolically. Uh, so, for example, 50 years ago, 23 activists climbed 3,000 feet to the top of Mount Rushmore and occupied it for several months. And as you can see from this land back call to action, people are still fighting for the shutdown of Mount Rushmore. Um, Nick Tilson of the NDN Collective reminds us that the Indigenous people have still refused to accept the settlement from the Supreme Court case, United States v. Sioux Nation of Indians. Um, which we went over earlier. He said, we have refused to accept the settlement, an amount that has slowly accrued interest and is now well over $1 billion. 
because we won't settle for anything less than the full return of our lands as stipulated by the treaties our nation signed and agreed upon. Another way to fight land grabs is to limit what corporations can own. For example, South Dakota, North Dakota, Minnesota, and some other states have banned corporate ownership of farmland. And that means that only farmers can buy farmland. Although a lot of those laws have been cut by corporate interest in recent years, now is the time to be bold. Another idea is to ban landlords who own too many homes. Like in Berlin, housing activists are trying to pass a law that would target landlords who own more than 3,000 units. If passed, the law would convert those units into public housing. And another idea is to slow down land grabs while we organize to ban land grabs altogether. Recently, we at the Law Center helped draft SB Senate Bill 1079 in California. The bill was introduced by Senator Nancy Skinner, who was inspired by the direct action of Moms for Housing. SB 1079 puts people over corporations. The policy would slow down land grabs by making outside investors wait for regular people to decide whether they want to put in a bid after the foreclosure auction. So instead of um, automatically going to the highest bidder, a foreclosed home could go to an eligible build, uh, eligible buyer instead. So what's an eligible buyer? Eligible buyers include tenants, cooperatives, land trusts, and people who intend to actually live in the home. SB 1079 prohibits the bundling of properties for sale at foreclosure. As we mentioned earlier, during the recession, banks would bundle a bunch of foreclosed homes and sell them to investors. That means they'd sell the properties at a discount, but regular families wouldn't be able to afford it because who's trying to buy a bundle of houses at the same time? SB 1079 made it such that banks must sell properties one at a time. If they want to sell it at a discount to move properties more, more quickly, then everyday people are now more likely to be able to compete. The governor signed SB 1079 last month. That's just the tip of the iceberg in what folks are doing to fight land grabs. Our guest speakers are going to talk about other campaigns they're working on. Everyone will get up to three minutes to talk and then we'll open it up to the fishbowl discussion. First up is Alvina Wong from APEN. Uh, hi, everyone, and thanks for that overview. Um, I think a lot of it was already covered, but I think something to know about Oakland, for example, and why the Moms for Housing campaign was so monumental is that about 60%, a little bit over 60% of our Oakland residents are renters. And of the 40% of like all the housing that's available, 40% of that is owned by big corporations. And when we look at apartments specifically, about 97% of apartment units in Oakland are owned by big corporations. And so anytime we are in these conversations about tenants rights and tenants opportunities to stay in the homes that they've been living in, a lot of times we get faced with these really um, uh, sad like small landlord, small homeowner stories. But the reality is that a lot of the housing that we live in and rent are owned by big corporations who don't live here, who aren't invested in our communities in the same way. And so um, uh, I saw it in the chat, this question about TOPA, COPA, T-O-P-A, C-O-P-A, um, which really stands for a Tenants Opportunity to Purchase Act or the Community Opportunity to Purchase Act. And what that wants aims to do is give opportunities for tenants who have been living in their homes the first right to buy their home if the landlord is to sell it. And so um, similar to what uh, Hope and Tia were describing, it's usually when a landlord decides to sell their property, they just put it on the market and try to get the highest bid. And what we're trying to assert and intervene in is to say that um, those who have been living there should be able to make decisions on what happens to their home, because depending on who buys it, that might mean that they have to move out or um, big changes are coming. And for a lot of um, folks in Oakland and many renters, 
oftentimes they're living there for five, 10 plus years. And so we really believe, and we know that um, the tenants that we organize really believe that they should have the first right to own the home and stay in there permanently. And we assert that if tenants aren't able to buy it by themselves, they should have support. They should have land trust and nonprofits to support them in staying in their homes and co-owning it together. And in the event that these tenants really don't want to or can't buy their homes, then we really think that we need to put more housing and more of these resources into the public commons, in which case communities, land trust, cities, um, other nonprofit housing developers should have the first right to buy or make an offer on the home. Um, and there's still challenges with it, right? It's still based on kind of what folks determine as fair market value. And then the hope is that once it's taken out of that market value, we can really um, recognize that these homes are not supposed to be for sale and be used as properties and um, investments, but really think about how we can use our homes as a way to stabilize our communities and continue building and growing our communities together. Um, so um, I think that's one of the really exciting things that we've done. We were um, connecting it with the Moms for Housing campaign because I think it really was the vision of that campaign for more and more tenants and residents to be able to be the first um, to buy or at least be able to compete with other bidders. And I think with COVID, we had to put a really big pause on it because the fight now is really to make sure, sorry, I'm timing myself, oops. Um, <laughs> the, the fight right now is really to make sure that those who are most impacted by COVID don't get kicked out and continue to further like the spread of COVID and also face homelessness. And so we've been pivoting into that fight and really thinking about how can we cancel debt and not continue to keep paying banks for owning our homes, but actually let our residents and homeowners and small landlords be able to, to stay and keep building into this community. So um, I'll pass it on to <laughs> the next speaker. Thank you, Alina. The next speaker is Lydia Lowe. So I just, I work for the Chinatown Community Land Trust. Our mission is to work for community control of development, um, community control of the land, development without displacement, um, permanently affordable housing and shared neighborhood spaces. And I just wanna talk in particular about work we're doing to try and preserve Chinatown's historic row houses, which were built in the early 19th century to house immigrant families, originally the Irish, then the Eastern Europeans, Lebanese and Syrians, and finally the Chinese. Um, because Chinatown in Boston is right up against down, the downtown financial district, um, that whole downtown revitalization has really hit um, the community hard. And we have had uh, more than two decades of luxury development beginning in 2000, which so that we started to see the real estate prices really go up. Um, then following the luxury development, we had the influx of the short-term rental industry. And so as the short-term rental industry started taking root, um, what we saw is that all of these um, little brick row houses, three, two, three, four-story row houses got emptied tenants got evicted, they were flipped, they became um, it, bought up by investors and full-time Airbnbs. Um, so what we've been doing to try and reclaim these um, buildings as homes, you know, which were bought, like already bought for super expensive prices, you know, a row house that used to be 500,000 was like selling for close to 2 million recently. Um, and, you know, so what we've been doing is both fighting on a policy level, but also on a building by building level. And I want to give you an example, like a couple of row houses on this block, the same block that we were trying to um, actually were own, one of them was owned by friends of ours and we tried to purchase it, you know, for 800,000. But an uh, investor came in and bought it for 1.3 million cash down. And why could he do that? Because he immediately uh, turned it into a full-time Airbnb. So first we got into a fight around, you know, as these investors bought it, we started organizing against the Airbnbs. We were able to get a state um, 
taxation of the short-term rental industry, one of the strongest short-term rental ordinances in the country. And then we also started fighting the variances that the investors applied for to try and after their Airbnbs became illegal, then they wanted to expand them to turn a two unit into a, a, into a five unit or, or a, into a four unit. Um, so we were able to fight and, and hold up these variances for like three years um, and getting, you know, making the owners, you know, spend money the whole time. And finally, it was through a lot of that organizing that we were finally able to uh, come in and purchase one of the row houses. The other one got their variance and is was promptly sued by the abutter. And we hope to acquire that one still. But, you know, in the meantime, on a policy level, while we're kind of like doing this organizing building by building and block by block, we're, you know, making sure that the short-term rental ordinance is fully implemented. We're trying to close the loophole, which is uh, something called an executive suite, where corporations can, you can sign a, a contract with a corporation for short-term rental use. Um, we're trying to create a row house protection area where we down zone those streets and also uh, make short-term rentals and executive suites a forbidden use. And then at the same time, at the state level, we're organizing for a real estate transfer tax on luxury transfers and a tenant option to purchase. So those are some of our approaches. Awesome, thank you. Um, next up is Jeff. Hey there, folks. I'm Jeff Conant with Friends of the Earth. I'm afraid there may be a little noise in the background. I'll try to speak up. Um, I am with Friends of the Earth where I run a campaign called Land Grabs, Forests, and Finance. And this campaign has an international focus. So in my few minutes, we'll be stepping back just a little bit from the actual land under our feet to consider one piece of the global perspective, um, which I'll describe as briefly as I can. Our broad objective is to halt the expansion of agribusiness plantations that are destroying tropical forests. And our approach is primarily focused on forests. The main refrain you'll hear from us, therefore, is hashtag defund deforestation, but it's always front of mind that forests are not divorced from the lands on which they grow and lands and forests are best protected when local and especially indigenous peoples have formal title to these lands and are economically and politically empowered to live in right relationship to these lands. In the global south, um, whether we're talking about Indonesia, West Africa, Mesoamerica, the vast majority of the lands that are targeted for agribusiness plantations are not formally titled to the people who live on and use those lands. And of course, we're talking about states with long and violent histories of colonization, dispossession, displacement, and enclosure of indigenous and Afro-descendant lands by the state and by multinational capital. So in taking on land grabs in these countries um, and globally, we look essentially at, at the corporate food web, if you will. What is the web of connections that enables multinational agribusiness companies to dispossess communities of their lands and to turn these ecologically and culturally rich territories into industrial production zones for palm oil, paper, beef, soy, and other agro commodities and who's financing these companies and how can we pressure the big banks and the big investors to change their practices in order to change the companies they finance and um, essentially to uphold international human rights uh, norms. So we work with um, allies to pressure companies to adopt better practices, for example, to require Require that their suppliers ban forced labor to undertake processes of free prior and informed consent to make their supply chains traceable and transparent so we can know where the deforestation is happening, where the land grabs are happening, where the human rights violations are occurring, and then we team up with local groups to keep the pressure on. Um, but the heart of our campaign isn't targeting the agribusiness companies directly. It's going upstairs, essentially going one step up the corporate food web uh, to identify identify the banks and in particular the investors who are underwriting these companies. So um, just to get a, a little bit concrete as I wrap up, uh, we just got shareholders at Procter & Gamble, which is the, you know, the largest consumer goods company in the world, to require the company to improve its disclosures of deforestation 
pension risk, which for us includes land grabbing. We've gotten the California Public Pension Fund, CalPERS, to name land rights and deforestation as investment risks, um, which implies a whole set of actions that they need to take. Uh, we've gotten TIAA, who I think you may hear more about later, a trillion dollar fund manager to divest from some of the worst agribusiness companies and use their shareholder power to vote against deforestation and land grabbing at other uh, companies. Um, and we helped to launch the BlackRock's Big Problem campaign, which is targeting the largest investment company in the world for its enabling of deforestation and land grabbing. And we've begun telling BlackRock, uh, and this is something we're very, it's very ambitious, but we're hopeful about it. We're telling BlackRock a $7 trillion investment fund that they need an advisory council made up of indigenous and frontline community leaders. And over the next several years, we're gonna do the work to help organize and cultivate this leader leadership to really make a push to get the people most impacted by the global land grab to have a hand in the way financial decisions get made at firms like this. Um, and I'll stop there. Thanks for your ears. Awesome. Thank you. Um, now we're going to move into um, some organizations vision for food, food and farm justice specifically. We'll start with Jesus. Hello, everybody. Um, so yeah, I think uh, just to 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 add um, to what has been shared and our perspective, uh, you know, we when we talk about land grabs, we we come from an agrarian perspective, but I think it is very important also to talk about uh, commodification of land. We are all standing in land, and uh, and people need accessible homes too, uh, also uh, ac uh, access to land, right? So I think that is very important to have into into consideration. That's something that we have in in our struggle for for access to land and uh, at least in at, as a global perspective uh, uh, in la via campesina we 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 talk about that uh, we understand the problem of land grabs because uh, our people are are living it right and we know that these land grabs come in the form of speculation of extraction of of having the control of 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 natural resources of commodification etc um, and we respond with access to land, right? So, so for us, um, it is very important to continue practicing forms of, of agriculture that are sustainable, like what we promote and practice, that is agroecology, a uh, way of doing agriculture that is connected with our ancestors and that we know is resilient to climate change. We know also it produces healthy food in abundance. And also, um, it's the way to achieve food sovereignty, right? Uh, it, it's the way that the agri-food system um, is controlled by the people and not by a handful of, of corporations. So for us, um, it is very important to connect these uh, solutions to when we're problematizing uh, land grabs because we are um, seeing how uh, different uh, states, especially uh, rich states, are even uh, la doing land grabs in other countries just to, to make sure their people. And uh, coming from a Puerto Rican context, I think it is very important also just to know, you know, we, we, we were colonized by, 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 by Spain. Uh, we have a, a constitutional relationship with the US, so we have a colonial relationship with the US. So for us, um, uh, fighting for access to land for our people, it's also decolonizing work. And um, um, especially during the times that, that um, that we're living. So for us, um, it is very important to also take into consideration um, organization, uh, political education, capacity building for farmers, and also agrarian reform. We need to have a, a, a cohesive plan of the distribution of land for the, for the people, for the working people that actually benefits the people and not this uh, handful of corporations that in the case of Puerto Rico, we have uh, all of these uh, major seed companies like Monsanto, Pioneer, DuPont, Syngenta that are experimenting on our best farming land. So uh, the people and the organizations, the collective uh, grassroots organizations have been organizing collective power through mutual support to actually um, have a plan, talk about reparations, talk about real access to land in order for us to be more sustainable and also uh, more independent in the terms of, of producing our own food. Thank you. Um, let's see, we have Jordan next. 
Hey, thank you. Uh, so just as a quick introduction, uh, my name is Jordan Treacle. I'm the National Programs and Policy Coordinator at the National Family Farm Coalition. Um, I use he, him pronouns, and uh, we represent uh, farmers, ranchers, and fishermen from uh, 40, in 42 states across the United States. And I'm uh, based in uh, traditional and accustomed territory uh, in, in Washington, D.C. Um, so I'm going to talk really briefly about uh, the Stop the Land Grabs campaign, of which we are one of uh, over 12 organizations that has been working since uh, 2008 to uh, track and oppose land grabs uh, in the U.S. as well as abroad. Um, so the Stop the Land Grabs campaign is an international alliance of civil society organizations, of which uh, Jeff, who just spoke earlier, um, is, a, is a member. Um, working to explode, expose the exploitative corporate investment in agriculture, and particularly the role of pension funds. So in, since 2008, pension fund funds have amassed an incredible amount of, of money globally, uh, upwards of $40 trillion. And um, farmland has emerged since the 2008 financial crisis as this sort of safe space or alternative market to park money to hedge against the fluctuations in the stock market. And one of the main players in that story has, is uh, TIA, or the Teachers Insurance and Annuity Association, with the, which is a US-based corporation. And they were a major player in developing and uh, deploying this farmland investment model. And they are one of the largest players in the US that, is in, uh, that have invested uh, over $3.4 billion in U.S. farmland over the past decade or so. And this is investment that is primarily in large-scale monocropping. Um, and, and done through some very predatory and concerning contract relationships with farmers on the ground, often many of whom are in some kind of crisis. Uh, so today, TIA is the largest landowner in the world. And they're the largest institutional landowner in the U.S. And they're, or they're a group that isn't really talked about as traditionally in this land grabbing conversation. So our goal is to, to raise awareness about the negative social, environmental, and economic impacts of corporate land ownership generally. And work with a range of allies to advance uh, policy and advocacy strategies to force um, divestment from agricultural land and the food system more generally. And I, I should have mentioned at the beginning that we're also a member of La Via Campesina, so we have lots of um, solidarity with Jesus and our other allies in Puerto Rico. And a major part of this campaign that we're not, I'm not going to talk about so much today, is also working with rural communities in Brazil to oppose land grabbing by TIA and its subsidiaries um, in that country. So I'll just mention really quickly three tactics that we work on in this campaign. Um, we, we work on advancing federal policy to support BIPOC farmers getting access to land and limiting corporate investment. We mentioned a couple of the uh, state level laws earlier in the introduction that speak to that. Uh, we also work with TIA pension holders, particularly university faculty. Um, to pass Senate resolutions on their campuses that are focused around divestment of their pension funds from TIA. And then the third tactic um, is that we are working with state-level coalitions to push um, state-level pension funds, who may be teachers, they may be other workers, to divest from TIA to, uh, and, and also prevent them uh, to uh, work with them to prevent their money being invested in pension funds like TIA in the first place. I'll leave it there and look forward to questions. Thanks. Um, is Savi here yet? I'm going to let everyone unmute. Oh, yes. Yeah. There you are. <laughs> it right. was pretty hard getting on the call because of some emergencies, but thank you for being oh, Sure. Um, I am because I have a number of like hard numbers and want to keep track of it. Um, uh, I, I'm going to uh, be looking at a document to really just paint the picture of why I feel African-American land loss 
can be contextualized as land, land grab. And even before we had that word, we had been living, um, living that reality. Um, so I uh, just want to, um, just by way of background, that the North Carolina Association of Black Lawyers had convened in the 1980s this task force, which is now the Land Loss Prevention Project, centering uh, the work in Eastern North Carolina, which there had been a disproportionate loss of African-American farmland. I just wanna go back and just kind of um, uplift some numbers some of you are pretty familiar with that by uh, 1910, 15, 50 years after the end of slavery, African-Americans had uh, 50 million acres of farmland and close to 900 and 925,000 farmers. And that right after the Great Depression, the number of farm population was half but the figure that I'd like to draw attention to is what happened in the midst of the civil rights movement, which is between 1954 and 1969, in which the number of full-time operators on farms dropped from 126,000 to 52,000, representing a 59% decline and, but what's even more interesting is what happened in uh, property. And I'm gonna center that with uh, the state of North Carolina. So in 1954, African-American farmers and landowners had 1,085,000 acres of land. This is in 1954 and that by um, 1969, you had 558,000 acres, a dramatic and drastic decline of 49%. And what is also of interest is that black farmers in the state went from 22,600 in 54 to 9,687. Um, so all of this is bringing us back to a place in which we see that the black farm population, black land ownership numbers decline during the period where African Americans were struggling for civil rights. And I, I think that's no accident why that happened that way. And, and that's why I believe strongly that just looking at the civil rights period and the complaint of that massive class action of black farmers really uh, graphically and, and very powerfully put African-American issues of land within the international South-South conversation around um, land grabbing. And uh, which is why I believe that moving forward, the uh, land needs to be centered as part of the reparations conversation and that the significant amount of uh, professoriate that we've had since the civil rights period that there need to be really targeted um, outreach to those communities around um, having their investment portfolio looked into, as well as to make demands as shareholders in, in these uh, various funds. So I, you know, I just wanna thank um, National Family Farm Coalition of which I am a member organization um, for this process. And I'd like to give a shout out to Noni and Kavita. It's nice seeing you all again. <laughs> And, and of course, Conan, I think you're the bomb. You just, you just do it and you uplift uh, the land question and land grab it internationally, centering it away from it being a US exceptionalism factor to an international look at it and what the movement of capital globally, non-respect of anyone does 
to Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities. So I just want to uplift the work of FOE and to thank you. Thank you. Um, next up is Neil. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Again, my name is Neil. I'm one half of the team at Minnow alongside um, my Nguyen. And Minnow is a project about land, and I'm going to talk about the context of California. Um, but at its core, it's a, a project that's fostering a sense of belonging for people of color, and particularly people of color who tend the earth here. And so our theory for how to do this is to dismantle, as um, has been already spoken to, the, the racialized disparity in land ownership, particularly rural land in California. And one strategy that we're gonna use to do this is to leverage the uh, massive amount of unearned wealth that currently resides in philanthropic institutions that are more than just legally, but morally responsible um, to be dedicated to the public good. Um, so what's our context? Nationally, the context around land ownership, rural land ownership is that 98% of land is owned by white people. Um, while 60% of the people who actually have their hands in the soil are people of color. And that holds true in California as well. And it got this way because of land grabs, both the history that Tia and Hope and others have shared, um, but also current and the reason why this disparity exists and why we exist, frankly, as a project. Um, and even currently, just to share that just a couple months ago, um, Amazon um, bought 66 acres of agricultural land in Gilroy, just a couple hours south of here. The land was assessed at seven and a half million dollars. Amazon came in and paid, wait for it, $31.3 million for 66 acres of land. And this kind of wild speculation, paying five, six times more than what the land is actually worth on this market um, is what puts land out of reach for people who have a direct connection to it um, and is what strips away the right of people to feel that sense of belonging and that, and that sense of place. Um, and land grabs can only exist in this context that Jesus already spoke to, where we commodify and we objectify land as something that can be bought and sold. The incentive to grab land exists only because there is the opportunity to profit from it by buying and selling it. And that's exactly how our farmland system is set up and organized. Um, there's massive consolidation, 8% of farms control 41% of um, all farmland. And here in the Sacramento Valley over the last decade and a half, the value of farmland has jumped 400%. So how do we expect farmers, again, farming is not um, an endeavor that creates profit for people who are growing food for people. Um, it's, it's an act of fate, really. Um, and, and so this idea that farms are gonna be able to compete on a marketplace when investors and, and tech companies are, are spending millions of dollars on land um, is impossible. Um, there's, no, there's no patience or empathy in a capitalist land market um, that, that would work for farmers. And this is where Minnow exists to, to try to intervene and try to interrupt um, those conditions that make land, um, land grabbing attractive. Um, it's as if we treat land as this thing that can be grabbed, like our, you know, our bodies are, we have autonomous control over our bodies. We don't let someone just grab our, our hand um, because it's not a commodity, it's a part of who we are. And so we're trying to sort of start this, you know, generate and uplift this narrative of land being um, something like akin to um, ourselves. Um, so I'll just share that the strategy that we're gonna use um, to try to sort of, Free the land is to make the land free. Um, there's a trillion dollars in philanthropic capital that philanthropy likes to think of themselves as a private actor, but this money actually is dedicated to the public good. And so we want to see them scale up their investment by spending down their endowments, many of which are actually invested in TIA, invested in BlackRock, invested in these same institutions that are perpetuating land grabs both here and abroad. So I'll stop there for now. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Next up is Richard um, filling in for Adai. 
Hey again, uh, Richard here from First Nations Development Institute. Um, if you're just joining, um, we work with um, Indian country and farmers in Indian country um, across the nation. Um, just listen to y'all talk is, is, is great. I think there's, there's so much going on. Um, a few things I'm working on um, that's, that's sparked up here is, is having um, conducted a few interviews for, for farm to school programs. Um, down in Albuquerque, um, and I learned um, some land was was recently donated to one of the small charter schools, um, which is always a big win um, for tribal communities, um, so they can do their farm program there. Um, and another thing that came out of that interview was how um, emotional the history of land grab is, um, not just for folks our age, but for um, folks in school. So um, at this Indigenous Charter School, you know, they're sharing a, a lot of this um, history where, you know, tribes owned um, and stewarded a lot of this land. And when they realize, um, you know, it, it doesn't, they're not the caretakers of it um, anymore just through um, losing it through land grabs. Um, I think it creates a ripple um, in, in families. Um, so things like, you know, walking the land um, seasonally, um, our relationship to it becomes even more important. Um, we work with tribal farms and farm programs um, throughout the United States. Um, and, and, you know, this topic today got me thinking about what that vision looks like for tribal farmers. And so there's 570 uh, for you know, federally recognized tribes, if you can picture a, a tribal farm in each of those communities, um, wouldn't that be great? But, but we shouldn't stop there because it's the interplay between um, the activities that happen between tribal farms um, and say youth, youth programs, uh, nonprofit farms, small market farms to actually create this um, power source where foods, traditional foods, um, today's foods, table foods, foods for um, animals and, and other resources can, can exist. And so that more of a holistic view of, of not having food access just being the end point, um, say we, we want a grocery store in our community, that, that's not our vision of what a healthy food community looks like. Um, we need to put our put our hands and our feet in the dirt, um, and so creating those um, multi entry points for for different activities to exist is just something that that I find very beautiful um, that drives the work that I do, and um, and yeah, I guess I I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so um, now we're going to move into visions for homes and housing. So let's start with Noni. Hi, um, I'm going to talk a little bit around our strategy for um, reclaiming land and housing um, in Oakland and the East Bay. Um, I think it's interesting. Uh, two things that I think um, stand out for me as we listen to um, this conversation and then also anticipate um, the comments that Karina is going to make after me. Um, one is, is that um, in my experience and to my knowledge, um, Black Americans typically are not recognized as having land rights, um, in general as having rights. Um, and Neil points out that, you know, um, the, the one inviolate thing we have is our bodies. But um, even more notably, often Black folks' bodies are not considered to be inviolate spaces, right? In all ways, um, particularly um, in this sort of uh, authentically lawless Western context, um, um, we, there is no sacred space for um, the Black American. Um, and then in particular in the urban areas, um, having been um, 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 sort of herded into um, labor housing, 
Um, and in some ways what became temporary housing that was meant to be workforce housing and then turned into urban projects and urban ghettos, um, we've always been understood as a temporary people who could be moved about and violated at will um, given the needs of the um, um, capitalist productive complex. So it's really interesting then when you're trying to build um, a movement that um, recognizes the inherent rights of black communities to remain and exist in spaces and communities in which they've held space for multiple generations um, in which they've contributed their paid labor, not to mention their unpaid labor that actually fueled the very industrial revolution that lands us in these urbanized conditions um, to boot. Um, so the East Bay Permanent Real Estate Cooperative is really thinking about what um, sovereignty and land rights mean for black urban folks and in particular in Oakland and um, I guess we're testing the difference between appealing to the nation that is supposed to protect us as opposed to contesting um, with market against market actors and attempting to conform the market to our needs and our vision, right? Um, so we are a people of color led multi-stakeholder cooperative that supports black, brown, indigenous and uh, marginalized community members to collectively acquire finance and long-term steward and asset managed land and housing in the East Bay. Um, and we're doing that through several means. Um, one of which is to um, go out and build the capital and finance relationships um, on behalf of our community, both through financial fitness as a cooperative organization, through organizing um, philanthropic investors, community investors, um, foundations to really think differently about what it means to lend to communities in a non-extractive ma manner, which essentially means cheaper money, which is the whole, uh, the, the whole device of the capitalist productive system. Um, and organizing our community members um, to be deeper in the conversation, um, more activated by um, the political civic possibilities of us moving ourselves in between speculators and our future. Um, and really um, sort of um, tagging and identifying ways to let our community leaders um, lead um, in the area of real estate and cooperative development that's typically separated from us by the silo of this expert wall. So we're trying to break down all of those divisions between what's typically seen as accessible to our ground level community members and what's possible for us and also exercising another way to understand our sovereignty um, and our rights to be in the communities where we've held space. So yeah, I think that's Thank you, Nani. All right, last but not least, Karina. I love that it said Nani for, for mayor. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much. My mind is just buzzing listening to everybody um, and the amazing work that folks are doing. And I come from a, a totally different space, I think. You know, a couple of years ago, um, some, a handful of years ago, uh, I was invited to a community land trust meeting for indigenous people. And there are only a handful of, of land trusts that, native, that are native run in the whole country. And today we were talking about thousands and millions of acres and stuff like that. And we're talking about in Alameda County, there was just in Alameda County, my tribe um, is actually encompasses five counties, but let's just talk about Alameda County. Alameda County is 473,000 acres. Native people own, if we use the word ownership now, uh, less than five acres of land. Uh, our tribe is not a federally recognized tribe, and so we are using this tool uh, to create a land, uh, land trust in order for us to bring indigenous land back into indigenous hands. Most of what we're talking about, uh, or what I've listened to, is this way of taking, we're talking about taking land back, and we're taking land back in these capitalist ideas still. 
and these ways of fighting, fighting them back using their own tools, which is why we created a land trust, because there was really no way for us to get our land back into our hands without using the tools that the United States government set on us, right? And so we were not given any land. When we talk about just our people here, most people that are indigenous or native people that came here, came here through the relocation process um, during the 50s and 60s to try to assimilate native people and to exterminate them. It was a part of the extermination process. It's still the invisibilizing of native people that's happening, right? And when you get into urban settings, you're talking about an even more invisibility, right? inside of Oakland by itself. I've lived here in Oakland my entire life, right? I grew up here, I raised my kids here. We look at different neighborhoods in Oakland and you have neighborhoods in Oakland that are predominantly black, predominantly Asian, predominantly uh, Latino. But here, where's that predominant native uh, community? There isn't, it's an invisibilization that happens here. And it makes it easy for people to bypass bringing, invisible, uh, bringing our voices to the table, right? It really has only been in the last few years that we've been really fighting and uplifting the voices and getting our allies and accomplices to lift up the voices of indigenous people with us, that we have a voice in an urban area where we have lived for thousands of generations, not just a few generations, but thousands of generations. And today we're looking at a time where people are building in every single place that you could possibly do. And our sacred sites are even more endangered right now. And we gives us, we don't, we don't have access to those sacred places, right? And we're not talking about in what most people say as a, as in the country or in the, in the forest or stuff, but we're talking about right here in Oakland where there are sacred sites, right here in Alameda where they're disturbing one of our burial sites that's been here for thousands of years. And so how do we then stop that, that progression, right? How do we work with folks that are doing this, trying to get housing because it's housing developments that are going up. It's housing developments that say that they're for low income people. How do we get people that are really doing work with and with uh, indigenous people to hear that these places are not are not necessarily good for folks to build on that there needs to be space that's available when we talk about the ideas of bringing together when there is two Ohlone people in all of Alameda County that own their own homes when most of the Ohlone people that need that have lived here for thousands of generations have had to move outside of our traditional territories in order to be here. We talk about this gender gentrification that's happening. We were the first ones that gentrified out and continue to have, have that happen. In order for us to continue to survive as indigenous people in our own territories, we need to have a land base. And the Segorite Land Trust is really about putting indigenous land back into indigenous hands, a way for us to do it, not just for Ohlone people, but for people that were forced relocated here and have not been able to go to their own homes. It's a spiritual centering of the land. It's not about ownership. It's not about playing the games of monopolizing uh, uh, land and saying that you own it and that you could trade it and, and buy it and sell it. But to remember our indigenous teachings that this land gives us life. It gives us everything that we need. It's not just about that. It's about, it's not just about the people that were once here, but the people that now live here and what is our responsibilities to the lands that we're on. And so really it's about those teachings is that how do we live in reciprocity with the people of the first, the first nation people of the land? How do we begin to respect the, the indigenous teachings? How do we look at Alameda County and by itself and say that in the last 200 years, we have destroyed all of our waterways and our systems that are, have been set here. How do we take care of the people that have come to live on our lands? How do we learn the histories of those things? And I think that that's where it's really important is that we, have to begin to think about this in a, in a much longer vision, not just a short-term vision, but how do we figure out a way for us to create 
these spaces where we're able to live our, as our ancestors did, no matter where you lived before, where your families came from originally, we lived in communities where we, we connected with each other, that we knew who each other was and we, and we depended on one another. We didn't depend on corporations or government systems that we have in place today, but we actually learned how to figure out how to live with one another to make sure that everyone was fed. When we look at Alameda County today, I look at the humongous, uh, what they call an, a, a crisis. And we all know working in housing and working in farming and working in all of these land projects right now, that there is not a crisis of housing, it's a crisis of greed. And so how do we then change the structures in which we live in so that it, is, it mirrors the ideas that we want to go for, forward with? I have grandchildren now that are here that are being pushed out of our territories now. And it just, I, it doesn't make any sense that we are continuously having to fight like this as black and brown and indigenous people to make sure that we have a place to stand and to hold sacred for ourselves. And so I, um, I'm going to stop right there, and I want to. I have so many questions for folks that are on this in this uh, this table, and uh, just thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Okay, now we're moving to the fishbowl conversation. Only ten minutes behind. Hope is going to read the instructions. Thank you so much to the panelists, Karina, dropping the mic right there. Um, really appreciate all this. Okay, so the fishbowl rules. Um, what we call the middle is when only two to four people may have their microphones on at a time, that's two to four. To tap in, um, you type, can I tap in? No, I'm just, can I tap in? <laughs> As an example. Okay, um, in the chat box and Tia will put you on the stack. And then to tap out, uh, if you've been in the fishbowl, so in the middle for a long time, and you see that someone is trying to tap in, feel free to say, I'm tapping out. Um, we have questions prepared, but please feel free to ask your own questions and ideas about how to fight corporate land grabs. This is a participatory, did I say that word right, event. Um, Neil and Noni will have volunteered, very brave souls, to start us off in the middle. And the first question is, if you had to explain to a 10-year-old what hashtag land back means, what would you say? Take it away, y'all. Let's say you, Noni. <laughs> I'd say there's lots of people who have lived here for a really long time and worked really hard to make this a place for us all to be. And then there were some new people who showed up and really liked what they saw, but didn't like the people that were there and kind of tricked them out of the land and then convinced them that they shouldn't have been there in the first place. And then told everybody else that came later that those people were never there. And so no one remembered that they had taken the land from the original nice people. So everybody thought they were good people and nobody thought it made sense to do anything about the people who had had their land taken. So now we're trying to remind everybody about what happened. So we all get to be here the way it was meant to be. I love it. I was gonna say that I would just share this recording with them and have them watch it, but I don't know that a 10 year old will be able to sit through it. <laughs> They'd be wow. so sad, Neil. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I, have to, I have nine years to, um, to figure out how I'm gonna yeah. say to a 10 year old. I have a one year old right now, so I'm taking lessons. Indeed. <laughs> I, it, was, um, it was wild to hear Karina at the, at the last moment there just shared the like, just bringing it really, um, like breaking it down to Alameda County. I mean, living in Alameda County and like really feeling that, you know, um, those 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 numbers of you know two people owning their own homes um, and people being pushed down and that legacy that sort of like manifests in, in um, the reality that we that we all in. I have a, you know. Um, just yeah, hits home. I have a I have a you know Segorite land trust you know lawn sign right outside of my outside of my house, and it puts in relief kind of just that as 
a symbol um, versus what the reality actually is. So it's a, it's a, a sobering reminder for um, the sort of like house by house, lot by lot, you know, work along with the sort of like global um, implications that, you know, Jeff and others were talking about, about how this is happening at this, you know, huge large scale with thousands of acres. Um, it, you know, all of it is, there's a, there's a through line between all of it that I was hearing. Yeah, I remember the first time, Karina, I saw your little hand card for the Segurite Land Trust about three years ago, and it had this piece of art on it where you could, it pictured the sort of the, 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 the old school shell mounds. And then in the back, you could kind of see like, you know, like Chevron City, you know, with the smoke coming out of industrialized buildings. Um, and it was like, pay your land tax. And it, it like gave me chills. Right for that to be said out loud, um, and in popular culture, it's been interesting to watch this revival of Black folks trying to tell the story of incidents like the Tulsa massacres um, and the Rosewood massacres. Because I began to run across so-called well-meaning people who had no idea that we, in, as fact, as Black folks, did have savvy. 1,800,000 acres of land by 1954. That means straight out of chains, we knew what was up with land and land ownership. And That's then right. this sort of false narrative has been perpetuated that we as black communities can't get ourselves together, can't, you know, this the same story that's perpetuated with our native folks, like that, like it never, like none of that ever happened. And then everyone else around us is convinced that there's no, there's a, not actually a story to tell. There's not actually an injustice that was enacted that's still holding, um, out, holding today. Um, and it's just when I, you know, when you yell out the window, pay your land tax, you're reminding folks that there's something that we're all responsible for here. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll tap on, on that and um, maybe open it to the next person. Um, Pia, can I? Yeah, I guess you were tapped in, you're in the middle. Awesome. Um, I just wanted to speak to real quick the earlier comments about 10 year olds having a really strong internal sense, um, such a young age. And I remember my really strong internal <laughs> sense of injustice. Um, what the first time I experienced racism was when I was nine. And, and being aware of that and not really knowing what to do with that, um, especially since both of my parents are white. I didn't know where to go. Um, also being in predominantly white communities, being one of two, you know, black kids in the school for most of my life. So um, yeah, I think it's good. Start young, have that conversation, Neil. <laughs> Start having that conversation now because um, that will do a lot for them. It would have done, meant everything to me. Uh, I wanna <laughs> switch the question, um, but also feel free people to kind of jump back to what speaks the most to you. Um, uh, so if the law center were to help start a ban land grabs campaign, would you join us? Go ahead. Gauntlet thrown. Let's go. <laughs> I'm not sure how to use this. Um, <laughs> yes, of course, uh, uh, you know, I believe that um, you know you can use law for uh, either progress or um, containment, and so I, uh, lawyers have an obligation to move the em envelope uh, forward. I have here the quote I'm looking off of Frederick Douglass: "If there is no struggle, there is no progress." And we can't make lawyering a part of that bad problem. So it's important that lawyers use their skill set in a very uh, supportive way to um, help uh, BIPOC and low-income folk retain uh, home ownership and land ownership. 
and to work um, to look at what's going on in other places and how our policies and laws are impacting communities worldwide. Uh, if I can tap in, I just respond to that and say, hope absolutely, I would, we would be interested in, in working with SELC on this. Um, you know, what we're finding is that a lot of the land governance, the way in which investment, corporate investment happens in the U.S. is on a state by state basis. And uh, that it can be problematic in that it can sometimes be a race to the bottom with certain states that have a historical injustice, particularly against BIPOC communities um, are, are more uh, open to or more close to making reforms around land and investment trends. And it also is challenging to build power when you're restricted by these boundaries of this, you know, in this colonial history of the U.S. And so for, for NFFC, we've been trying to explore thinking about what is the role of federal policy um, that can look at this in a holistic, more holistic view. And, and you get into some really tricky um, legal and policy histories there that folks like SL, SELC and some of the other law uh, schools that we're working with can be really helpful in, in pulling out those pieces and figuring out ways that federal policy can be used to complement um, some of the state level um, um, legislative efforts like SB 1070 that was mentioned earlier. So we would enthusiastically work with you all on that and see how we can find um, strategies that can be um, worked out across across the country and complement some of the work that organizations like Land Loss Prevention Project have done on things like heirs property in particular states. And some of, uh, some of our other members have been doing specifically on land rights for, for African-American communities at the state level. I wanted to just jump in because I, um, I work some with Jordan on the, the national campaign. And one thing we've seen, I mean, I think we can assume that, you know, landlords and banks and others who we consider maybe <laughs> bad actors or powerful actors are aware of, of what they're doing. You know, they're aware of the, of the subprime mortgage crisis. They're aware that they're uh, using their power for their own good. But what we've seen is that public pension funds um, are invested in this stuff and they're not necessarily aware. There's a lot of, you know, they're one example, I think, of a powerful actor that uh, when we approached, we meaning the campaign that Jordan and I and others are working on, we approached the Vermont State Pension Fund and told them about the impacts of TIA's uh, farmland uh, speculation and they were actually very sympathetic and they said, we had no idea that this was a problem. So tell us more, which is just a way of saying that a lot of education of, of policymakers, of decision makers um, is, is needed here. And especially from you know, the voices of, of the most impacted uh, folks, because um, there's an assumption in this country that if something makes money, that uh, that's a good thing and everyone's benefiting. And of course we are the communities who are, um, challenging that and saying that is not the way it works at all. So I think I, I think I tapped in um, and I'm not sure who else has tapped in with me, uh, but join. Um, I just wanted to, to um, you know, this question around um, policy, I feel like is one that um, I struggle with um, and I'm curious to hear other people's um, thoughts on it. Yeah, from, from the teaching from, you know, Tia and Hope, what you all shared, it was like a clear takeaway was that the weight of public policy throughout history points has pointed in one direction and it's pointed in the direction of dispossession. And so I, I, I struggle with, and I'm curious to hear more about the strategy and how to strategize around public policy as a vehicle and I, you know, and I, and I heard about TOPA and COPA and these and similar and SB 1079 as, as examples, which, um, but, but, you know, the Dawes Act that you mentioned, that was like hundreds of millions of acres that, that switched over pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and the poli what are the policy proposals that are really the visionary policy proposals that are going to have a similar impact and what's needed to make that happen? I think that's a question that I struggle with that I'd love to hear other people share. 
Well, I'm sorry. So from the heirs property piece, um, we're really interested in expanding the adoption of the Uniform Partition of Heirs Property Act, which changed the dynamics of how state law works to uh, dispossess heirs property owner. I think that's critical. Um, so with black land laws, it's the forces of actors from the state and the federal. And um, so it's important that we strengthen state laws to assist uh, retention of, of land. And, um, and I think part of that is the recognition that, you know, when you have state and federal laws coming together in public policy in a negative way, then it's up to people at state level to begin to change them actively by um, getting involved in conversations around land ownership and how it's owned. And strengthen community land trust. So here in North Carolina, you can have a cooperative of land ownership. So, and that might be the case elsewhere that co-ops in land um, is discouraged by state law. Davi, thank you so much for sharing. I had a question. Um, I actually live in the Bay and it's so crazy that, you know, I didn't expect to connect with North Carolina here today, but I, I'm in the Bay. I've been here for eight years, but I grew up in North Carolina. I grew up in Eastern North Carolina. Uh -huh. um, and my grandfather was actually one of the largest landowners in my community for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, and he was a farmer. So I grew up riding the tractor with my grandfather. And mm -hmm. um, I just wonder about um, just the, I remember, you know, growing up and always knowing that my uncles and my aunts, you know, they didn't want to farm anymore <laughs> at one point. Right. They moved up north and, um, you know, some of my grandfather, you know, he, my uncle still has some of my grandfather's land, about 65 acres. Um, but, you know, that shift with the great migration um, to the north and to the west and how that, when it, you think about the 60s and the 70s mm -hmm. where black people mm -hmm. went and um, for different reasons, you know, whether it was um, in some places terrorism, mm -hmm. um, in some mm -hmm. places uh, it was, you know, people leaving for more industrial mm -hmm. work in the cities and how that cultural um, kind of dynamic shifted things as far as black people and their relationship to land, you know. Um, and I wonder when we're talking about like the shift around land, are we factoring in that? And here in the West, I'm thinking about like, has there been effort to um, kind of reconnect with and to kind of um, go back to people that moved here, that moved because of terrorism, because they were forced off of their land, mm -hmm. um, where communities can like, maybe there can be some reconnection for folks that are in Texas and Mississippi um, who actually own their land, but they moved West because they were scared for their lives, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know what efforts have been done around that kind of. Um, yeah, I, I think it's very important that we begin to um, connect the stories to shift the narrative, the role of the state, state-sponsored terrorism against um, segments of the population. And I, I you know, I, I think when we begin to explore the stories, we begin to see what has happened with George Floyd, what happened in, um, in Missouri, um, you know, uh, Michael Brown and all of those. If you strip back the story, you get back to where land was dispossessed and people moved um, from, from sometimes small communities of safety into more urbanized centers. And, um, and, and then there is this dislocation and people become more vulnerable um, to, to, uh, to, to violence and um, in different ways. So I, you know, so I think there is a project to be made around shifting the narrative by uh, retelling the stories of how people got to where 
they got to, I mean, like, so um, members of my family, when they met, um, because I'm also from the uh, Caribbean, and so I just also want to uplift the fact that the Arawaks were moved off that land, those islands in the Caribbean due to a European um, uh, pandemics that was needed out on native people. And um, so, I, so I just feel that once we begin to look at narratives, we'll weave a different, a different way of looking at it and shape our conversations in community and hopefully influence public policy and law as we, as we see that we do have the power um, to shift the narrative and, and to change laws. And it's not, it's not a majoritarian perspective, but that the law is there to be shifted by the will of the people. And so I'm hoping that we'll get to that place. I must say what I see uh, Noni's doing and, and listening to um, Karina gives me hope that uh, we can make it happen. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> I know that some people tapped in so that they could answer some questions, but I just wanted to let Elliot Hellman, thank you so much for interpreting. Um, he's only with us until two o'clock and it's already 2.01. We can go over a few more minutes, but without the interpreter. Reigns is closed captioning, thank goodness. So um, I'm gonna tap out and we have Savi, Tashan, Noni, and Lydia. Sorry if I mispronounced your name, in the circle. I just wanted to echo the importance of learning about our stories. And I think that, you know, we've made a lot of progress. Um, you know, I'm in, I'm in my 60s now. We've made a lot of progress from the time since I was young um, so that we learn our own stories. But I think that a lot of times we're just learning our own story in a, in a vacuum and not each other's stories. So, you know, so I know that, um, you know, the Chinese, you know, were very important in reclaiming farmland in California and that they were um, prevented from owning land by alien land laws. I know that um, they were sent to um, uh, do, you know, the sugarcane and Hawaii and in the Caribbean. But I think it's important then you step back and you say like, well, why was that happening? It's because, you know, they were brought in as replacement for slave labor, you know, in the Caribbean or they were brought in, you know, mm -hmm. um, you know, after um, the mission system. And, and, you know, so I think it's important that we see how our own histories in the context of, of the different, you know, all of the different streams. And there is a consistency there. It's all about using people um, for profit, not letting them benefit from their labor and, um, and pitting people against each other or, or segmenting them in different sectors of the economy and, you know, in, in, and, and dispossessing people. And I think, um, you know, so to me, being here and hearing a lot about the indigenous history is so meaningful and so powerful because I think that's where we kind of look back, you know, look way back and we start to see how all of the different threads come together. That's right. Jesus, you're tapped in. Did you? Yeah. Um, yeah, I just wanted to share a little bit about what I've been hearing and also just sharing a little bit about like how, how like the centrality of land to many of our, to many of our mm -hmm. struggles, right? And I think we, we have learned a lot from, from peasants, from farm workers, from farmers, from uh, indigenous communities, black communities, brown people uh, in general, um, that really, we see any opportunity, we, we say here rescates de terreno, um, any opportunity to rescue land, right? Colonized land in order for folks to produce it, to live in it is, is, is un logro, it's, uh, it's a victory, right? We, we are in, in the middle of, of constant, constantly struggling on, on pushing our governments at the municipal level, at the national level for sustainable public policy, right? For policy, for access to land. Um, 
it's really hard recognizing that, you know, that we are challenging an economy that doesn't value life and that finds a way to extract from any, <laughs> any, any of our uh, natural resources, right? So, but, but that struggle, I think, is very important to, to keep it going. Uh, we have done, we have achieved some public policy here to, to at least assure farming land for farmers, but to really access that is another story. Um, and, um, and at the same time, we're, we're, we are challenged by the nonprofit industrial complex trying to, to play the game that we don't want to play. So in this sense, we are talking about collective tenure, access to land, but we need capital to, to, <laughs> to buy land. Um, so in this sense, it's, it's, I, I think it is very important to talk about the centrality of these aspects and also like the organizing process to access land that is very important and also at the policy level. But at the end, we say our farmers have, have, have taught us any opportunity to, to if, if it's something that you have a conversation in your town, in your community, you have the land that is not yours, but at least you're using it. And at the end, you can, you can have it or you can access this or you can find funds to access it. Are, is very important. The only thing is that with climate change, we are we are running behind because really most of the challenges that we have as, as communities in the world uh, wouldn't be happening if, if the land was in, 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 the, in the hands of the people. Yeah, <clears throat> if I can, in, in the vein of rescuing any land that you can, um, you know, uh, initially we were focusing particularly on on um, collectively owned housing situations, and out of the corner of our eye, we were kind of looking at the ways that mixed use um, acquisitions could be in service to this vision um, in some ways that would sort of like exponentially spread the impact. And as a West Oaklander, um, we are working on this mixed use acquisition on um, historic 7th Street. And it, because part of our, our, our motto is not just bringing in the capital, but also organizing the people, it's led to kind of realizing that, that there is an untapped and buried vision of my community that that that's that's really hasn't been led on since the 50s or the 60s right mm -hmm. um and it's giving this amazing opportunity to like rescue stories and rescue communities and 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 if you know anything about the black story that we we are constantly let our bodies are legislated out of public space right and so then you think processes like uh, racialized rapid gentrification is a complete process in the same way you think that um, native genocide is a complete process when it's actually far from it, right? And people forget that story and then they go, they go along with sort of the, the, the patterns, the entrenchments, the hopelessness of gentrification. When there's, we, go, we went door knocking with Mandela Grocery and I was like, well, look at all these black people who go and stay in their house because it, we're legislated out of public space. And my native friends whose whole life is on reservations and we've none of us have ever been to reservations. This, this story is not complete. And so it's like, there's still this space if you can, if you can get the narrative out there to, to rescue our futures, because there's more to it. Good job. Uh, my God, this conversation is so good. It makes me want to go to law school and do land law. <laughs> okay, well, even though we tried to create spaciousness by making this an hour and a half long, <laughs> we're still over time. But thank you all so much for joining us. I will email you um, all of the resources, the recording, the slides, um, contact information for the people for the panelists, if they want to be contacted, I'll ask them first. And I hope you have a good day. It is the end of Radical Real Estate Week. Thank you all so much for joining us. Please donate if you can at theselk.org. Give. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. It's really great. <laughs> Thanks so much, everyone.